thinking I'm just a little bit worried about. Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogue. And I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to once again speak with Ambassador Michael Oren, the former ambassador to the United States from the State of Israel, former member of Knesset, former deputy minister, of, uh, prime minister of the State of Israel, but the current American-born Israeli historian, author, politician, and just a person who has made a real difference in this world by being involved and by being a proud member of Israel and the Jewish people. So Ambassador Aaron, thank you so much for joining me today. A pleasure, a pleasure to be back with you. Shalom to everybody. It is great. For those of you who don't remember, Ambassador Aaron, the last time we spoke, where we were talking about his latest book, was which is a collection of short stories. If my pitch the last time wasn't strong enough for everyone to buy it and read it, it's the Night Archer. Buy it on Amazon. It's real. It's a wonderful, wonderful read and some beautiful stories as well. Ambassador Aaron also has his MA, his PhD from Princeton. He's taught everywhere you can imagine, from American universities and Harvard and Yale and in Israel. Um, and it just, it's great to see you and thank you so very much for joining me today. I'm a pleasure to be with you and I hope the dog that's barking outside the window doesn't bother you. <laughs> no, it's, but it's great. I, I have no control over that whatsoever. But it, looks, but, but it looks like the weather know, is uh, pretty good. It's, uh, it, the weather is, is uh, we're outside because it's about 110 degrees <laughs> inside. Right. It's too hard to be inside. So it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, well, right now, I just came off the Israeli news. Um, and the big issue here today is the BDS, is the Ben and Jerry's boycott. And for those of your listeners who don't understand the significance of this, it is, it is, it is immensely, immensely significant. Um, it is the first time that a major corporation uh, in the United States and a corporation which has a tremendous um, uh, visibility. It is, it is, a, it is a, uh, an emblem. Um, it, uh, it's not exactly Haagen-Dazs. If it's been Haagen-Dazs, it would be different. Actually, Haagen-Dazs is, is owned by a rather right-wing <laughs> American Jew. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 this is very different. And it's uh, progressive Jews who uh, established Ben & Jerry's with Ben & Jerry's. It is, it is immensely significant. What's significant about it is not, it's not just like, um, some of the boycotts that we've ch seen in Europe, for example, of the wine and, and other products, which boycotted the entire, say, West Bank, Judea, and Samaria. This is a boycott that literally singles out the Jews. It singles out the Jews, which is, which is amazing. Um, so if you have a, 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 a shopping center in Ramallah, they're going to carry Bez and Jerry's. But if you have a shopping center in Ariel or in Gilo, or in Shiloh, they're not going to carry Ben Jenny. So it's a kind of it's kind of a selection. And you know, while I'm sure the intent uh, of the of the people who are mounting this boycott is not you know overtly anti-Semitic, I don't think Ben and Jerry are anti-Semitic, but th that this foments and bolsters anti-Semitism, there's no question about it. And it opens the door to similar boycotts by other corporations um, that are you know that are similarly pro prominent extremely, extremely dangerous for us. You were gonna ask a question? Yeah, no, I'm just curious when you're thinking of what brought about this, what, what's the political culture that allowed something like this to occur? I think it's almost inevitable from what's happening in the United States. Um, I, you know, if you saw the recent poll that was done by a, 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 a pollster that was uh, affiliated with the Democratic Party and the results came out uh, just about a week and a half ago, the results were startling, startling, stunning. It said that 34% of American Jews believe that Israel is a racist country. 34%, a third. 25% believe that Israel is an apartheid state. And the worst statistic of all was that 23% believe that Israel is committing genocide against the Palestinians. This was now, a study of Jews? Yes. American Jews. So now we're talking about nearly a quarter of all American Jews believe that we are placing Palestinians in ovens and gassing them, genocide. Now, in that type of environment, I, I, I question whether those 24% even know what genocide is truly to define it. Uh, and if you were to tell them that the Palestinian population of Judea and Samaria has quadrupled since 1967, where exactly is Israel committing genocide? It doesn't matter because facts have become irrelevant. We're in a post-fact 
environment. It's about feelings. And if people feel that Israel's committing Jewish genocide, they're feeling flashback. But what, why are these Jews saying this when it's so profoundly, emphatically counterfactual? And the reason is because they're in an environment. They are students on campuses where Israel is regularly accused of genocide. They are reading the New York Times, which runs full page pictures of Palestinian children allegedly killed by Israeli fire during the recent battle in, in Lebanon. I'm basically a blood libel. So the entire environment has become toxic and frankly anti-Semitic. I think the New York Times front page was anti-Semitic. Uh, they're not sing there are no pictures put this way of the thousands and thousands and thousands of Iraqi, Syrian and Afghani children who have been killed by American forces. None. But wasn't that picture that the front page picture on the New York Times, wasn't it also imitating something that had been in Haaretz? Thank you, but Haaretz is, is also <laughs> deeply steeped in, in anti-Semitism. Sure. And Haaretz comes out and calls Israel an apartheid state all the time. But the Haaretz is, is read by 20,000 people, if that, here. And they're read by, by, by 20,000 people, plus the head of the New York Times you know, bureau, chief, bureau chief in Israel. That's who reads this stuff. And um, so these American Jews are, are steeped in an environment of delegitimization and vilification of Israel. And so when asked the question, is Israel committing genocide against the Palestinians, they're gonna say yes, because that's what they've been told. Now, so you asked me, where does the Ben and Jerry decision come from? This is where it comes from. And that in fact, it's probably the least of the reactions we can kind of expect because they are not boycotting the state of Israel itself. They're only boycotting the Jews who are living in Judea and Samaria and East Jerusalem, by the way, which is the majority of the Jewish population of Jerusalem lives in, lives in formerly East Jerusalem. And nobody knows where East Jerusalem is anymore. Um, so we can expect far more. With the, the, the danger of the Ben and Jerry's is that it is such a popular brand. Everybody knows Jerry, Ben and Jerry's. Everyone loves Ben and Jerry's. So if Ben and Jerry's is boycotting Jews in Israel, why not Nabisco? Why not Nestle? Why not X number of other products? Ben and Jerry's. If you had the ability to, to really direct the American Jewish community, no one does, unfortunately, what would you say that we should be doing in response to this? Do two things. One, I'm sorry, three things. Correction. One, buy no more Ben and Jerry's. And make you know, videos of throwing out the Ben and Jerry's that are in your refrigerator. Two, support legislation in your home state that equates uh, boycotting with Israel with anti-Semitism. And I, here I have to take a little bit of a credit. This was uh, my idea back in 2014 when I came back uh, from Washington. I published an article in Politico, which is a, you know, the political magazine of uh, newspaper of Washington, D.C. And I made a suggestion. I suggested that, that states adopt the Carter era uh, legislation that that criminalized cooperation with the Arab boycott. You know, there used to be an Arab boycott in this country. We didn't have Pepsi, we didn't have McDonald's, we didn't have Burger King. We were a much healthier society back then. Uh, we didn't have Honda, we didn't have a lot of things uh, because of the boycott. And the boycott almost disappeared overnight because of that legislation. And you know, it's not, I'm not one to give uh, Jimmy Carter a lot of credit for a lot of things, but he deserved credit for this. And um, so I published this article in Political, I said, let's take the same legislation and let's apply it to BDS. Anybody who cooperates with BDS and boycotting Israel um, should pay a penalty. Certainly, in terms of won't get federal funding, it could actually be federally, uh, it could actually uh, be federally um, penalized. And to date, and I, to, I'm very proud of this. To date, some 30 state legislatures have adopted this legislation. Now, members of your community should then be turning to their uh, state representatives and saying, you have this legislation in your state. Um, uh, actually, it started in Illinois, I want to tell you. It started in Illinois. Um, you, it, it enacted against Ben and Jerry's. No one should ever, a, a pint of Ben and Jerry's should not be st sold in, in, the, in the state of Illinois. And that would set an unequivocal message. Remember, this is a company at the end of the day. It's got shareholders. And, you know, they're going to, shareholders are going to come back to the board and say, you want to play politics, you play politics with your dime, not with our dime. The third thing you have to do, and this is the hard thing, well, everything I've said now is easy. You know, throwing out Ben and Jerry's is easy. Making a phone call to your state representative is easy. This is hard. Educate. Get a hold of precisely these Jews 
who believe that we are sticking Palestinians in ovens. Get a hold of these Jews who believe that we have separate bathrooms for Jews and Arabs. That's apartheid. Um, and educate them. Educate them about the realities of the state of Israel. Is the situation uh, in these territories, Judea and Samaria, West Bank, is it ideal? It is not. It's deeply, deeply complex. I was a, an advisor for Yitzhak Rabin in the early 90s. And I went through this entire peace process. I was also a consultant on the Trump peace plan. I've been through every one of them. I will tell you at the end of the day that the chances of achieving that two-state solution are probably less than zero. Because it's complex. Not because people don't want it. It's because it's complex. But, you know, that people have to understand to be, to be educated about. It. And they're not. They know nothing. They don't know any. They, don't, they have no idea where Nablus is, where Tukaram is. They don't know where these settlements are. They don't know the history behind them. So educate that's a that's a major task and the education is something that obviously is more than a major task because how do you get the people to be willing to even listen to our story that well they're they're they're, there i don't necessarily have them you know i don't have the magic wand for that but um begin to reach out bring to reach out to the reform congregations in your in your area and I'm sure in those reform congregations, they maybe have rabbis who are, you know, maybe rabbis for human rights and, and educate them, invite them in. Does the state of Israel do enough in terms of positive PR about Israel? Or is it something that's just too big for any country to handle? We do not do enough. Um, but it begs the question, if we did do enough, how much of an impact would it have? And um, again, as someone who's been involved in this for many, many years, I will say that we do not do enough. We don't begin to do enough. But even if we did do enough, um, it wouldn't make all that much of an impact, maybe 15, 20 percent, 30 percent at the most, because, alas, again, we're in a post factual world. It's about feelings. And we could create a Palestinian state tomorrow on the 67 borders. We could redivide Jerusalem. And I don't think it would have a major impact on these statistics. Would not. Because it's no longer about what we do, it's about who we are. And in the minds of these progressives, we are a colonialist white supremacist state. Forget the fact the majority of people in the state of Israel are people of color, okay? We're a white supremacist state. Forget the fact that Israel defeated colonialism. We, we, we arose from a, a battle, a successful battle against colonialism, one of the most successful ever against the British. Forget about that. We are a, it has nothing to do with facts, with feelings to a white supremacist, racist, colonialist state. Whatever we do, they're gonna say, oh, it's, it's you know, pink washing, and it's gay washing, it's different type of washing. They won't accept it, but it's still, I think it's incumbent upon us, particularly with our fellow Jews, to do our utmost, and we're not doing it. And, and to go back to that, because the statistic you started with from the Democratic uh, survey is, is frightening. Within yes. our population in the American Jewish world, We've seen so many begin to move away from Israel. Birthright was one thing that was supposed to be a panacea almost to bring people back to the love of Israel. And there have been tens of thousands of college students who've gone on. Have, are, we getting the, are we getting any kind of benefit from that program? Is there a We way? are. We are. And I was Israel's representative on the birthright board. And, and we are. And I look at all the statistics. But keep in mind, this is a 10-day trip to Israel. With no follow-up, um, as far as the state of Israel is concerned, is the American Jewish communities are responsible for the follow-up, uh, not the state of Israel, and that has not been done. Very little, um, and you know, again, these students are going back to a campuses where they are absolutely inundated in anti-Israel uh, propaganda, inundated. And um, I, I don't want to mention the name of a university, but I was recently invited to. Um, teach at a very prestigious American university. And uh, apparently under pressure, uh, the university rescinded the invitation. And there's nobody at this university that is teaching anything remotely pro-Israel. So, you know, if the, these universities are producing America's uh, future leaders, but they're not getting anything, these future leaders, that would enable them to make a, a even a, an objective judgment about Israel and its policies. And when you look at the American political leadership of today, mm. those who are of the older generation yes. are supportive of Israel. You'll still see them appear at the APAC or, or at other events. 
do, when you're looking and you see the people, let's say in their 40s and 50s and senior positions in American government, do you see the shift already? Yes, you do. And, um, you know, you have Joe Biden, the president, who remembers the Six Day War, remembers the 73 war. He, he was here meeting with Golda Meir, heir of uh, Yom Kippur, okay. uh, 1973. Oh, yeah. Uh, the people around him feel the very similar. I think Tony Blinken feels the same way. Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, feels that way. But you have the next generation of people who don't remember, <laughs> don't remember Yosef, and they don't remember these events. And you know, the Holocaust is ancient history for them. And um, and they come out of these universities. They all come out of the elite universities in Washington. Ten years ago, I could tell just by the way a young advisor or consultant spoke what kind of professors they had. Um, and sometimes I can actually identify the professor. They had. <laughs> I know of one case of someone very high up in the National Security Council. I know exactly the professor he had by the way he spoke. And um, this is they, they are deeply informed and influenced by these people. And um, it is it is difficult for us. The, um, the Schusterman Foundation, other great groups uh, do a, a important service by promoting Israel studies on campuses. Um, but it's when well, you're dealing with a situation. There goes our dog again. I'm sorry. It's not mine, neighbor. Um, when you deal with a particular situation where someone like me who had, comes from an academic background and I've you know, taught at Harvard, Yale, and Georgetown, I can't get to American campus. That is, that is, a, that is a, a huge challenge. And when you look at the support that, the, that America has for Israel, you know, once upon a time we were talking about the the loan guarantees that were, were so critical for Israel, but as the years have gone on and with the growth of Israel's economy, those kinds of financial support, that kind of financial support isn't as significant as it once was. True. The support of and, and I think I think I, let me just interrupt for Sefton and say that it's important that we don't lose sense of con of context, even in that very bad poll about American Jewry has said the 67 American, 67 percent of American Jews still feel emotionally attached to Israel, have some type of emotional attachment to Israel. And that's important. We can't overlook that. Uh, American public opinion generally about Israel still remains very favorable. It's less so if you break it down by party, less so if you break it down by age. But overall, Israel remains overwhelmingly popular in the United States of America. Um, our problem in America is not Israel's popularity. It's our problem is, is American isolationism and America's withdrawal from the world, that's a problem. Uh, that America seems incapable or unwilling to reject major military power anywhere in the world today um, is, is a, it undermines a fundamental assumption uh, of the state of Israel, and not only the state of Israel, of Japan, of Germany, of South Korea, and many countries that for um, now several generations have depended on America's willingness and ability to project power. That's not happening at a time when the Chinese are projecting power, the Turks are projecting power, and the Russians are projecting power, a great deal of power. The withdrawal of Afghanistan is, of, is troubling to you because of that, for example? If anybody thinks that America can withdraw from Afghanistan and not endanger Taiwan and not endanger the Eastern Ukraine, they are kidding themselves. And to take- <laughs> Can I put that stronger? I don't what I just told you, I, I tell to American, uh, senior American generals. And I, I gather they would probably agree with you. No, I know no. some of them did, some of them didn't. And what would be their response? Well, maybe they're being a little politic, but, uh, you know, um, their response is, no, we, we have to get out of this war. The war's not going anywhere. It's actually bleeding us. Um, it's a global, and this is going to sound tautological, but it's a global world. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you pull forces out of Syria, um, then the Chinese are going to look at that and say, well, America's not really going to defend Taiwan, is it? And the Russians are going to say, well, America's not really going to defend Ukraine, is it? And, um, and that's, that's just the way, internet, that's, how, that's how human nature works. It's how international affairs are conducted. Um, you know, it's a little bit about, you know, the, the, the leaf in the, in the hurricane, you know, that... Um, Belief falls a certain way and sets off a, ser a, a series of events that impact world history. But it's really like that in the world. Um, you can pull out of Afghanistan, but it's going to make um, other countries, many other countries in the world, far less secure. And that's not something Democratic or Republican. It's just because President Trump had started that process. It's just the it's American. Totally I'll tell you, it's bipartisan. It's Actually, Obama's 
That's one of our bipartisan areas that's left, apparently. Period. And, uh, you know, the Democrats and Republicans don't like hearing this. But on this score, Obama, Trump, and Biden are exactly alike. They're all about pulling out. And, um, and that is a, a difficult, challenging situation for Israel. Not impossible. We are a strong state. Um, and we won the Six-Day War without firing a single American bullet. We didn't have any American bullets. Um, but it's, it is a sea change. And the quicker we internalize that, the better. Is with the new government that's in place and its own internal challenges of trying to maintain its coalition, are, is Israel still positioned to respond forcefully? To what? To which threat? Let's take first the political, the, the BDS threat, then the middle, military threat. We are. I mean, it would be nice if the Biden administration, you know, instructed, uh, issued a say, uh, they, they condemned uh, the boycott, but they didn't take any measures beyond condemnation. But certainly we are in a position to encourage our supporters throughout the United States to activate, um, to contact your, your state representatives and to activate that legislation against, against Ben and Jerry's. We are in a position to do that, certainly. And militarily, where Israel is today, if it had to do something on its own without American support, it's, it, it can? It can. Is it ideal? No. And the American support would generally be in terms of providing additional arms, or or because Israel has never wanted to come. In, in every in every conflict we've had going back to two thousand and six, the second Lebanon war, we've had to turn to the United States for resupply for ammunition. We use up a lot of ammo, but not just that. We also need what I call the diplomatic and legal iron dome. So, for example, if we go into a war with Hezbollah, Hezbollah has placed one hundred and fifty thousand rockets under two under. 200 Lebanese villages. Uh, the IDF is training to go into those villages. We're going to have to go village, village, house, house. Civilians will be killed. That's what his brothers wants. So we're going to need somebody to help us. We're going to need someone to give us that Iron Dome in the Security Council, someone to give us the Iron Dome in the International Criminal Court. Uh, that has to be the United States of America. No one else is going to do it. And we celebrated in the UN when Nikki Haley was the, was the ambassador of the United Nations, her strong support of Israel. It seemed to have been a, a breath of fresh air. Was that an anomaly? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a, fa a fascinating factoid about Nikki Haley that I discovered when I was in uh, Knesset. So in 2016, Nikki Haley convened the Security Council to discuss aggression against Israel. So I turned to my staff. I said, let's go back in history and find out how many times and when the Security Council convened to discuss aggression against Israel. You know how many times? My guess is from the question zero. Zero. Nikki Haley, for the first time, convened that Security Council to discuss someone attacking us. Isn't that great? Uh, no, it's a her. I remember. Grace, it's a great factor. But do we do we feel we have that kind of support still in the United Nations or elsewhere? In the United it depends. It depends. Um, you know, if we build a large number of settlements, we will not have that support. Um, if we go to war against Iran, for example, without having a very clear case, a causes belly, we will not have it. And um, if we are forced to inflict a large number of civilian casualties, I think it's going to be iffy. Which is scary, all of this. And it is indeed, but, but we'll get through it. We, we've gotten through a lot worse. And so from that perspective, you are still positive about the about not only the future of the state of Israel, but the future of the Jewish state of Israel at the same time. I'm, I'm excessively positive about the Jewish state of Israel. It's not as if we don't face immense challenges. We have face immense challenges in terms of um, the economic gap between rich and poor. It's one of the largest economic gaps in the world after the United States and Mexico, by the way. A uh, million Israeli children are beneath the poverty line. I am uh, concerned about demographic issues, particularly the, the inability of the refusal of the Israeli state to impose its sovereignty. I was in the Negev today, and the entire Negev is covered with illegal Bedouin settlements, illegal. I, I built an illegal settlement here in Jaffa, they'll, <laughs> they'll come and rip it up. We don't oppose our sovereignty. We don't oppose the laws against polygamy. 30% of Bedouin men are, are, have four wives who are purchased from neighboring states. Uh, we don't impose those laws. We don't impose our laws over the Haredi population. 
we, we don't insist they give their kids an education that's better than a second grade education. That kind of, these things keep me awake at night. Um, not necessarily the Iran issue, because I, I think that we're strong enough and we'll deal with it. But Israel, with all of its difficulties, by any criteria, is a super successful state, whether it's, it's, it's per capita income, healthcare. Oh my God, the healthcare in this country. The education system on the university level. All of our universities are in the top, if not top 100, then the top 500 of the world. Um, our innovation, we're number one in innovation. Israel is, is forging the 21st century. And we are the example of how a country can respect its past and also look to the future, how we can be democratic and also be a nation at arms. We can be a nation state, but also diverse. Um, we are one of the five countries in the world that has never known a second of non-democratic governance. Think about that. We're the only, the only state on that list that's never known a second of peace. So by, by any criteria, we're, we're like off the charts. Does that mean we don't have serious problems? We have serious problems. I am less optimistic about many trends in the American Jewish community. And that poll really showed it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I live in fear of the wicked son syndrome of American Jews who don't feel that they're part of the Jewish people and what it means to have a shared destiny of the Jewish people. We can disagree on issues, but we have to have a shared destiny. And um, I, I fear the wicked son. There's a reason why the wicked son is in there. He's scary. But on the other hand, we still have been able to be successful to have him at the table for the Seder. So there's still mm -hmm. hope. Um, you know, it's an, I'll, I'll give you a piece of optimistic uh, observation. I think I may have said this in my talk about my book, is that when I grew up in America, um, you know, the big question of American Jewish writers, Philip Roth, Bernard Malamud, right, uh, Saul Bellow, is how, I can, how can I be an American and a Jew at the same time? How did, they couldn't reconcile the two identities. That, that's the tension in all their books. And today, you scoot ahead 60, 70 years, American Jews not only don't ask that question, they don't even understand the question. They don't understand the question. So this is a sign of great success in the American Jewish community. You're a success story. One of the great success stories of, of, the, of the American experience. The question is, does, is our success a, a boon to our identity or a threat to our identity? Which, unfortunately, our time is up. But I also have to say that one of the great things that we're proud of is the Aliyah from the United States to Israel, not as large as it should be. This Shabbat in our shul, we're actually celebrating four families who are making Aliyah this summer. The Rosses, the Shikers, the Baron and Eliana Feifel. We're just thrilled about that. And the fact that so much of our future, so much of our, of our entire identity is tied in with the state of Israel and you have played such an important role in making it stronger and better. We will reach out to the state reps. That's gonna be my first phone call after this interview is over. <laughs> And I thank you so very, very much for your time once again, Ambassador. It is truly an honor and a pleasure to be able to speak and learn from you. Have a wonderful evening. Enjoy you too. Thank you, Stephanie, for making this happen. Stephanie, thank you very much for making this happen. Bye-bye. Call to. Call okay. to. Be well.